Bonjour tout le monde. J'aimerais peut-être mieux vous dire bon matin. Je sais que c'était un, un lève. Vous, avez, vous êtes levé très tôt ce matin pour être présent avec nous. Euh, C'est un jour important pour nous. Fait que bienvenue à l'Agence spatiale canadienne et puis bienvenue également aux gens qui, qui nous suivent sur les médias sociaux ce matin. Vous, vous le savez qu'aujourd'hui, c'est une journée très importante là, pour nous, puisque David Saint-Jacques euh, va décoller vers la Station spatiale internationale dans quelques minutes. Il nous fait donc euh, très, très plaisir de vous accueillir en si grand nombre et de partager avec nous ce moment historique dans le programme spatial canadien. Mais sans plus tarder, j'aimerais vraiment vous présenter un invité spécial qui est avec nous. C'est un honneur et privilège pour nous d'avoir l'honorable Davdeep. Davdeep. Sorry, sir. Davdeep. I practiced it so much. <laughs> Davdeep Baines, euh, le ministre de l'Innovation, des Sciences et du Développement économique. Minister, please join us on stage to say us a few words. Thank you very much. early in the morning. <laughs> no worries. It's, uh, it's not about me. It's about David. So trust me, I, I don't mind at all. Thank you very, very much uh, for that introduction, uh, Luke, and uh, for your warm welcome uh, on this early but very, very exciting morning. Uh, L'espace a toujours été une passion pour moi. C'est une unique uh, de vivre l'expérience en direct d'un lancement et du départ d'un astronaute canadien dans l'espace. Je me sens privilégié d'être ici aujourd'hui. As you can see from this room, uh, Canada has a long and proud history when it comes to space. So many Canadians are proud of our space program. And today marks an exciting moment in time for all Canadians. A moment that I know I'll be talking to Uh, and with my young daughters, Nanki and Kirpa, who couldn't join me, and they're very, very mad uh, because they had to go to school for years to come. So I can only imagine how David must feel as he gets ready for a journey of a lifetime. Space has a power to inspire humanity uh, to greater heights. And rising to the challenge of space, it encourages us to push the limits of what is truly possible. Uh, and in the first few minutes uh, after takeoff, the Soyuz launcher will put out millions of horsepower. It will reach uh, orbital speed of almost 29,000 kilometers per hour. And the crew will travel a distance from here to St. John's, Newfoundland in less than 10 minutes. And it's also worth noting, and it's a point of pride, that David will become the ninth Canadian Space Agency astronaut He'll spend over six months in space as part of the International Space Station. And I know that Bob is here, and Bob, uh, you spent 170, 187 days, so he'll spend a little bit longer than you, so sorry about that, Bob. <laughs> But uh, during that time, he'll conduct nine Canadian health science experiments and seven, several international ones. And he'll test new technologies, and yes, he'll fly the iconic Canada Arm 2. And with this important work, with each breathtaking picture of the Earth he sends us, with each contact he makes with his home planet, he will bring us along on this unbelievably exciting adventure. You know, two weeks ago, we celebrated the 20th anniversary of the International Space Station. That's 20 years of peaceful international collaboration in the largest and arguably the most complex engineering project in human history. You know, the station has helped us understand how to live and work together in space. And I look forward to following David's mission as he showcases Canadian robots, conducts groundbreaking science, tests new technologies, and most of all, seeing the Canadian flag on his shoulder, which will inspire young Canadians to reach for the stars. Mesdames et messieurs, c'est le temps d'encourager David pour nous décrire ce qu'il ressent en ce moment. Personne n'est mieux placé qu'un astronaute qui est déjà allé en mission et quelqu'un qui suivra un jour ses traces. So without further ado, it is my absolute honor to welcome Bob 
Thirsk, the first Canadian astronaut to fly along and along and be part of a long duration mission and expedition. And of course, our new astronaut, Jenny City Gibbons, one of Canada's newest recruits, to please come on stage and take us to the next few minutes and what's going on to be part of this very exciting launch. Thank you very much. Bonjour tout le monde. Je suis Jenny Saidi Gibbons. Je suis très contente d'être ici pour partager ce moment avec vous. I was selected in the latest Canadian Space Agency astronaut recruitment campaign in July 2017, and since then, I have been undergoing basic astronaut training in Houston, Texas. Bonjour, mes amis. Je suis Bob Thirsk, ancien astronaut de l'Agence spatiale canadienne. La dernière fois que j'étais ici, c'était la dernière fois qu'un astronaut canadien a uh, lancé dans l'espace. C'était pour mon copain, Chris Hadfield. And today it was a special adventure because we have another Canadian astronaut who's about to launch in space. I think that we need more Canadian astronauts to launch in space so that I can come here more often. I agree. We like you, Bob. You should come back. <laughs> so after almost a decade of preparation and training as an astronaut, David Saint-Jacques is ready to fly in space. Now, it takes a lot of work, and I know this is a lifelong dream for David, so let's just take a closer look about what it takes to get there. L'Agence spatiale canadienne s'envolera vers la Station spatiale internationale. Après une dizaine d'années de préparation, dont des milliers d'heures de formation et d'entraînement, je suis sur le point de réaliser un rêve. C'est en 2008 que l'aventure de David Saint-Jacques pour devenir un jour astronaute débute. Après un long processus de sélection de plus d'un an, au mois de mai 2009, David Saint-Jacques est recruté par l'Agence spatiale canadienne. Il devient officiellement astronaute canadien. Quand j'ai appris que j'avais été sélectionné, j'ai réalisé à quel point j'étais privilégié. Peu de gens ont cette chance. Il débute alors une longue formation et suit divers entraînements pour acquérir toutes les connaissances nécessaires à sa nouvelle vocation. La formation et mon entraînement ont été exigeants, complexes, mais quelle aventure! C'est en mai 2016 qu'on annonce que David Saint-Jacques est affecté à une mission. C'est officiel, David partira dans l'espace. Je suis honoré de représenter les Canadiens dans cette mission. Vous m'avez choisi, vous m'avez formé, vous m'accordez votre confiance. Je promets de faire de mon mieux pour être à la hauteur de vos attentes. David est maintenant affecté à sa première mission. Il doit suivre un programme de formation sur mesure pour préparer son séjour dans l'espace. C'est une mission de six mois à bord de la Station spatiale internationale qui m'attend. Depuis des mois, je partage mon temps entre le Canada, l'Europe, le Japon, la Russie et les États-Unis pour me préparer pour ma mission spatiale. L'entraînement et la formation de David sont officiellement terminés. Je vais maintenant avoir la chance de mettre en application toutes les connaissances et les compétences que j'ai acquises. Le 3 décembre 2018, c'est le jour J. David Saint-Jacques va s'envoler de Baikonur au Kazakhstan pour rejoindre la Station spatiale internationale. Je suis enfin prêt à me rapprocher des étoiles. On se revoit dans l'espace. Pretty special. As you can see, it takes a lot of training and hard work to be ready to get to space. Bob, does that bring back memories for you? Yes, it does. The, the video was excellent, uh, and it just reinforced to me how important, how long, how hard the training is. And it's because, you know, space flight is difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, the vehicles that we fly in are, are very complex. So there's a lot of technical skills that I had to acquire for the first time ever. Launch, rendezvous, docking, robotics, spacewalking, EVA, um, assembly. 
Uh, those are important skills, but also teamwork and leadership skills um, as well. So there's often only one time that we have an opportunity to do something correctly in orbit, and we have to do it correctly and quickly, uh, and that's why the training is, is so important. But David and his crewmates, they are confident today. The training has been good. They will have mission success. They're ready. That's great to see. So David will shortly be en route for the International Space Station. During his mission, he will conduct Canadian and international science experiments and technology demonstrations. Actually, David, interestingly, will take part in every Canadian experiment that happens in space during his mission, which is special. Most of these experiments have to do with the human body and understanding it better both in space and here on Earth. So he'll be looking at things like the brain, blood, bones, uh, exposure to radiation, perception, and even a psychosocial experiment while he's there. Chances are, David will also use Canadarm2 to capture a visiting cargo vehicle during his stay on the International Space Station, and he is fully trained to perform a spacewalk should the opportunity arise. Et comme le ministre vient de dire, uh, si tout uh, se passe comme prévu, David sera de retour sur Terre en juin 2019, meaning he will become the CSA astronaut with the longest time in space. But first, David and his crew need to actually get to the International Space Station, and to do so, they will be riding the Russian rocket, the Soyuz. David is co-pilot of this vehicle, which means that he will assist his commander, Oleg Kanenenko, in flying the spacecraft. Now, the training for the Soyuz rocket is very complex and all in Russian, but I'm not surprised David aced his exams. You know, the best thing about the International Space Station program is it is international. Uh, as has already been mentioned, I had the opportunity as part of the, the ISS crew to fly up to space on a Russian rocket. And uh, I had the ride of my life. Russians have a lot of really interesting traditions that are associated with their spro space program. And since I flew with them, I had also a chance to experience them as, as well. So for example, uh, just a couple weeks ago, David and his crewmates, after they had uh, passed their exams, uh, went to the wall of the Kremlin where Yuri Gagarin and some other Russian heroes are, are interred and laid some, uh, a wreath there in, in respect. Uh, just a few days ago, when they arrived at the Baikonur Cosmodrome, where they're currently located, the crewmates all hoisted their flag of their national country. So right now, over the Kazakhstan co Cosmodrome, there is a Canadian flag flying. How cool nice is that? Nice to see again. Uh, and just a couple of days ago, uh, David and his crewmates went to the Cosmonaut Garden, very close to the, the residence where they're staying right now and they planted a tree, and each crew member is allowed to plant a tree representing the first time that they fly. And my understanding is that David planted a poplar tree. Maybe it was a Canadian poplar, I, I don't know. That would be nice. It's really neat to see, especially that line of trees, and I know Yuri Gargarin, first man in space, has a tree there, so do you, Bob? It's a maple tree, mine it's is a, a maple, maple tree. tree. <laughs> especially nice. And then uh, also a couple of days ago, uh, the Soyuz rocket was rolled out by train from its factory, not too far away in the Cosmodrome, to the launch pad, David's uh, family, friends, colleagues, uh, and the back crew were able to watch the, the Soyuz rocket uh, roll to the vertical uh, position. The tradition in the Russian uh, space program is that the prime crew does not watch the, um, the rollout and, and the, um, the placement of the, of the rocket on the launch pad. For some reason, it's just uh, something we don't do. Nice. Well. There are a number of uh, other traditions that take part actually on the day that you are to launch on the Soyuz, correct, Bob? Yes. Um, I think these are particularly interesting. So um, the first is the door signing. So when David this morning with his crew would have left the Cosmonaut Hotel where he would be staying, he would sign the door. And this door is particularly interesting because every astronaut and cosmonaut who has taken part in the International Space Station program has signed this door. Here's Chris Hadfield signing the door. Of course. Bob's signature is there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, after this, there would be a blessing by an Orthodox priest, which is very traditional for Russian cosmonauts prior to flying. This happens ahead of every Soyuz flight, and I think it's quite a lot of water, if Bob would remember correctly. <laughs> we need a towel. <laughs> uh, and then before leaving the Cosmonaut Hotel and boarding the bus, 
um, to where you would launch, you put on your Sokol suit and perform final tests. Uh, the Sokol suit is the suit that you kind of wear uh, out to the rocket and actually during the launch. And it's pretty interesting. Obviously. Yeah, it's a, it's a pressure suit, which means that if for some reason the, the capsule should depressurize during launch or during the uh, the period on orbit before um, docking with the, the station, it will inflate and, and keep and provide life support to the, the crew. The thing about uh, the Sokol suit, as opposed to the orange pumpkin suit that you know is associated with the shuttle program, is that it's sized so that you can are comfortable when you're in the curled up position inside the, the, the Soyuz capsule. It's not sized to be erect stand erect. So when we wear it, and you'll probably see some of the video of David walking out uh, to the launch pad today, we walk around like little old uh, men Hunchbacks. and women out there. It's, it's not glamorous. It doesn't make daytime TV, but uh, that's the way it is. But it keeps us alive, so we're very grateful for it. <laughs> so you wear it. It's still OK. <laughs> um, one of my favorite traditions um, about launch day is that when you see views inside the actual Soyuz capsule where the crew are sitting, you'll see these stuffed animals that are hanging from the instrument panel in Soyuz. Um, and those are really interesting because we call those actually an anti or a, a G meter. And what a G meter is, is it's the first indication that we'll get that the crew's actually in orbit. So we'll see it float up in a, in a microgravity environment. And of course, they'll feel it, but it's our indication that yes, he's there, he's in space. Um, and traditionally, that stuffed animal belongs to a son or daughter of the commander of the Soyuz, but in this case, there are two stuffed animals, one for David's family and one for Anne's family. So look out for those when launch happens. Jenny, there's one more tradition you didn't mention. Oh, I skipped it. So, uh, just a couple of hours ago, the, the bus that took the crewmates uh, from the, the Cosmonaut Hotel to the launch pad, mm -hmm. didn't drive immediately up to the launch pad. It stopped about 200 meters away from the launch pad. What happened there? The three crew members got out of the bus. They walked to the right rear tire, and at least for the men, they deposited some urine <laughs> on the rear tire. Now, this is the goofiest thing that you've ever heard of, and you're asking, I know you're all saying, why? It's because Yuri Gagarin did it 50 years ago, and he had a successful mission, and therefore today, if you want to have a successful mission, get out of the bus, go to the right rear tire, urinate on the tire, and you will have a successful mission. It's just one of those traditions. I can't believe I missed that one. If the first guy in space does it, you have to do it too. It's the rule, right? Right. So, the Soyuz is currently the only vehicle that can fly humans between the Earth and the International Space Station, but that's going to change soon. During David's mission, the first commercial crew vehicles are planned to launch and dock to the International Space Station, heralding a new era in space flight. It'll be very and, busy, but exciting. And Jenny, when uh, Canada joins the Lunar Gateway program, this is likely to be the vehicle that will take you to orbit and hopefully to deep space. It's pretty exciting. Can't imagine that yet. <laughs> So I heard that there's many other groups and organizations mm -hmm. that have gotten up early, like us, to participate in the, in the launch activities. Uh, it's really gratifying that uh, space can really bring this country together and be so supportive of our crewmates that fly up into space. Uh, a special hello to, um, to all of you. Well, we have some friends that are um, uh, in various places in, in Canada right now. I think you have some friends. Yeah, I want to say a particular hello or gway to the Mi'kmaq community watching from Nova Scotia this morning. And a shout out to our colleague Dave Williams, uh, former Ask Canadian Space Agency astronaut who's with his friends at the Ontario Science Centre in Toronto. And we also have one location in Ottawa at the Canada Aviation and Space uh, Museum. So let's go over to see what's happening over there in Ottawa. Good morning, Ian. Oh. I was wondering, as you were talking about all of the uh, Russian traditions, though, um, Baikonur is a pretty special place that not many of us have been to. Um, what's it like to do quarantine in Russia? Uh, great question, Ian. So the reason for quarantine is that if uh, a virus or a bacteria gets aboard the International Space Station, it will quickly move throughout all of the crew. So the purpose of quarantine is, number one, to separate the crew from the, from the public, to minimize the risk of picking up a, an infection that uh, could be transmitted to other crewmates aboard the station. 
But also, Ian, uh, the other reason for being in Baikonur for several days before launch is to go to your vehicle, to your launch vehicle, uh, do last minute stowage of all the important items and make sure you're familiar with where things are, are laid out. Check out your suit, make sure that all the connections, the oxygen, the communication uh, works properly. And then to have last minute briefings, safety uh, briefings, search and rescue briefings to make sure that you're 100% confident that uh, the mission and the launch are gonna be fine. So it's a busy time in Baikonur. I think actually, looking at the time, we have about five minutes until launch, so we're running a bit behind. We can't make them wait for us, unfortunately, so we're gonna have to kind of speed along. We can't put in a call. <laughs> um, Maybe, Bob, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about what uh, David's day has been like uh, today while we're waiting. Uh, we all see the exciting bits, but there's kind of a fair bit of kind of actually literally hanging around on launch day. Yeah, so he'll get up about nine hours uh, before flight. Uh, he'll have uh, breakfast with his uh, crewmates and the, and the backup crew as, as well. Uh, they'll say, uh, uh, they'll do a fit check with their Soyuz suit, pressurize it, make sure that it's airtight. I uh, have a last minute press conference with all of the Russian VIP uh, dignitaries and international dignitaries. Wave from a distance to their, their families. Board the bus that takes them out to the, uh, to the launch pad. Uh, once they get aboard the spacecraft, there is a little bit of waiting there. As Soon as they enter the spacecraft, uh, there's a number of activities to, to do and we'll talk about those in a, in, a, in a couple of minutes. Okay, great. Sorry, go ahead, Jenny. No, I was just saying thank you. <laughs> so how long have they been on board, Bob? Uh, they've been on board for about uh, two hours right now. Um, again, as soon as they get aboard the spacecraft, there's a number of uh, operations that need to perform. Uh, but there's a little bit of, uh, if everything is, is activated properly, there's some fun time there as well. And I think they listen to some special music. Yeah, they get to choose their own music for the launch, which is nice when you're kind of waiting there for two and a half hours and ready to go. I think David has published his, uh, his list of songs. When I uh, launched, I also had the opportunity to choose songs, and I just thought it'd be appropriate to choose the Rolling Stones, Start Me Up. I thought that would be appropriate for the day. Get you ready to go? <laughs> well, we have, I think, really three minutes till launch. So I think we got to go. Ian, nice Thank talking you to you. Thank you so much. All the best uh, to our friends there in Ottawa. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you so much. All right, we're getting down to it now. Do we have time for the video? No video, we're going straight to NASA TV. You ready? So, this is, uh, there's two cameras inside the capsule. Uh, one that is looking down at uh, the commander on your bottom left there, who is mm -hmm. Oleg Kononenko. And then in the top right, we know who that person is. Familiar seated. face. Yeah, so Jenny, what do you, you're a good friend, you're a close friend of David. What do you think is going through his mind right now? Well, David's a pretty excited guy anyway. I think today he'll probably be pretty calm. He always remembers his team, so he'll be thinking of everyone who got him there, thinking of his family, of course. Um, but I remember one of the first times that I met David, actually. Um, he asked me why I wanted to become an astronaut. And this was pretty early on. It was right after our announcement. I was still just so excited. Um, and he shared why he wanted to become an astronaut. And for him, it was the humanity of it. He wanted to see the big picture, the Earth from up there. So I think something he's going to be thinking about as he gets closer and closer to something that he's been working on for so long, that's going to be on his mind. Just this calm preparedness, but ready to see that dream. David strikes me as a very thoughtful, reflective person. And I hope he does take that personal time on orbit just to look out the window and think about um, civilization and his family and, and him. Those uh, moments are precious. It's exciting. Wonderful. Um, this is a Soyuz rocket. Mm -hmm. And um, this is going to be a three-stage launch. Uh, a Soyuz rocket here is made up of three stages. So the first stage is going to fire for two minutes right here. It's largely, most of the thrust is coming from four booster rockets that are on the, the lower end of, of, the, uh, of the Soyuz stack. Uh, it was one of these booster rockets that created the launch difficulty in, in October. After two minutes, those booster engines will fall off and an engine right here will ignite and will take uh, the rest of the, take the rocket up for about another six minutes or so. And then the very last stage is just below here. It will fire for the last two minutes or so the la of the eight and a half minutes it takes to get to space and it will take the, the crew up. And as the minister said, to a speed of about um, 
28,000, 29,000 kilometers per hour, 25 uh, times the, the speed of sound, eight kilometers per second. It's incredible. And the crew are sitting up here in their Soyuz capsule right now. So there's David right now. Yeah, right there. Wow. Um, after launch, uh, there'll be a couple of important events that occur at uh, the, around the two minute mark. Number one, the launch escape tower will jettison off. So you'll see a puff of smoke at around the two minute mark. Don't be concerned. Um, also, the, the first stage separation will occur at around two minutes. Another puff of smoke, don't be concerned. Um, and then the rocket fairing will fall away. And that means that the windows that the crew have in their Soyuz vehicle will now stream full of sunlight. And that will be David's first view of this glorious planet down below as he's still rocketing up to space. That's what he's been waiting for. It's pretty exciting for us to see. Less than a minute to go. Vehicle is now on internal power. You can see the first umbilical tower retracted. The engines will ignite a few seconds before liftoff, build up thrust, and the liftoff is actually rather gentle. The, inside, the only Auto clue we had that uh, launch was occurring was the countdown clock Auto started going up positive. Second tower now retracting wow. 10 seconds from launch. And then what do you feel? Shaking. Sh shaking, Second rattling, three. rolling. Engines crew very started focused. and are now at the preliminary thrust level, throttling up. And liftoff. Hi, yeah, lift off of Anne McLean to beat St. Jacques and Oleg Kononenko blasting through the Kazakh sky to the International Space Station. Copy. Everything looking good so far. Good first stage performance. Soyuz delivering 930,000 pounds of thrust. Copy. Everything is fine on board. 30 seconds into flight, all parameters are nominal. 30 seconds in, everything's still looking good. First stage will burn for two minutes, first two minutes and six seconds of the flight. The flight, uh, stabilization is steady, Copy. 140 tons of propellant taking the space. Uh, chamber pressure is nominal. What should we be looking to see now? Yeah, well, the launch escape tower will jettison. Everything looking good. Vehicle is stable. Good first stage performance. The ve uh, vehicle now traveling over 1,100 miles per hour. We'll see a flash as the first stage uh, is jettisoned and the second stage kicks in. For a brief second, the crew will go from 4 Gs to 0 Gs and then back to 4 Gs. It's a wild, wild ride. Is One minute, 30 seconds into the flight, everything's still looking good. The stage again will burn for, the f for until 1 minute, 58 seconds into the flight, and you'll see those four strap-on boosters jettison. And that's the first stage. Wow. So what's the crew doing right now? I mean, what were you... There's all kinds of displays up here that we're checking to make sure the rocket is firing properly. Escape tower has been um, jettisoned, and those four strap-on boosters also jettisoned. They've completed their job and will drop away at an altitude of 28 miles. Wow. Oleg cannot reach the uh, control panel with his hand, so he's holding a swizzle stick there or a rod. Transitioning to an animation you can see from the launch pad, losing sight of the Soyuz, but getting good for, um, second stage performance. We're feeling fine and everything is actually on board. Copy and uh, a vehicle is stable. And what do we have here? What are these graphics show us at the bottom? So their speed is two kilometers per second. second. Stage, this They're moving stage, very fast. Uh, this well, is the G level. So has been jettisoned, revealing the Soyuz underneath. At first, at the end of first stage, they had four Gs of acceleration. They dropped down to weightlessness. To until four and they're starting to build up thrust again. Into the, flight. the fairings have been jettisoned, so David has a view of the of the Earth now. Everything looking good. This uh, second stage providing somewhere between 178,000 and 222,000 pounds of thrust. So they're uh, 100 kilometers high and 190 kilometers downrange from the Cosmodrome. 
And this is their launch trajectory. This is uh, where they want to get to in nine minutes. And they're here right now. So they're about a third of the way up to space right now. Wow. This is what we call the second stage right here. Everything's still looking good. One the minute first left stage, the second stage. Third stage, stage will ignite at this point right here. Right in the middle of the animation, you'll see a lattice structure. That will be where the third stage will start to burn, begin a hot staging technique, start burning before the end of the uh, second stage and actually push that second stage away. Wow. So at this point, the crew is feeling an increasing G load. Is that right? Yes. So this is the G level down here. So yeah, right now, they're feeling about two Gs. Before they get to space, it'll creep back up to four Gs again. It feels like four people are sitting on your chest. Wow. You actually have to work at breathing <sighs> to get enough air into your lungs. I can imagine. Does the suit that you're wearing help with that? Um, yes, the but there's also suit? training as well. So what we'll do is we'll Everything's contract our thigh muscles, contract our abdominal muscles to keep burning. the blood up in the central area around the chest and the head. Wow. Getting ready for second stage here. In 80 seconds into flight. Now, once they get to orbit, in a few more minutes, we're expecting we that... confirmation of a good second stage separation. The third stage is lit. We'll burn for about four minutes and two seconds, providing 67,000 pounds of thrust. 300 seconds. This launch is going phenomenally well so far. If it goes completely well, we expect that David will uh, rendezvous and dock to the station in six hours in, in four orbits uh, of the Earth. Mm -hmm. If there is a problem, uh, a thruster problem, for example, he might have to demode to a two-day uh, rendezvous, which is something that I did uh, several Five years ago. Five minutes, 30 seconds into the flight. We're in the that third stage now. Everything's still looking good. That means that he'll dock on the International Space Station when? In a couple, two days' time? Two days' time. Two days' time. Yeah. 48 hours. The third stage will continue to burn until about uh, 8 minutes, 45 seconds into the flight. Wow. Two days, that's a long time in a very small space. The capsule is only two meters in diameter, so about this in breadth, and you've got three people sitting there. That's a lot. Like this. Everything is excellent on board. The Soyuz, the crew is doing well. Wow. So again, at the um, end of the, the second board, stage, they drop back well down to zero G, and they're building back up again. Six minutes and 15 seconds into the flight. So they're traveling now at uh, near five kilometers per second, almost 200 kilometers high, and 900 kilometers downrange from Baikonur. Wow. And when, what are we waiting for? When, are they, when will we know that they're in space? When that number reaches 8,000 meters per second, they'll be very, very close. Mm -hmm. Uh, the rockets will suddenly shut down. The crew is wearing a five-point harness. They'll all get flung forward. Their, their limbs will get flung forward. There will be a lot of yelling and Seven screaming inside the because they just survived one of the more dangerous things that human beings do. Yeah. Uh, and the G-meter that um, Jenny described a few minutes ago will no longer be hanging straight down. It will begin to float. 430 seconds into flight. All thrusters are operating nominally coffee, and we're feeling well. Still getting good reports from the crew, feeling well as we're 7 minutes 30 seconds into the flight. The velocity now almost 13,500 miles per hour. That's great news. David's well. Once the third stage delivers the Soyuz to orbit and the module is separated, a series of pre-programmed commands will be executed to prepare the Soyuz for orbital operations. These stored commands, called time-tagged commands, allow many of the Soyuz systems to be automatically activated by onboard computers at precise times stored in those computers. Eight minutes into the flight, everything's still looking good. Again, this third stage burns until eight minutes, 45 seconds. Once they reach orbit, um, there'll be a separation right at this point here. Separate the third stage from the Soyuz vehicle. And shortly after that, some of these antennas at the front here that are folded in, they will unfold. 
And a little bit later, the solar rays, which are also folded in tight to the hull of the vehicle, will also unfold. Eight minutes, 30 seconds into the flight, still looking good. 15 more seconds until third stage cutoff and separation. The crew will be very busy. It's not uh, time to relax yet. Uh, in the next orbit, the next 90 minutes, they'll have to do two major engine firings to circularize their orbit and to raise their orbit from 200 kilometers up to about 300 kilometers. And we have confirmation of third stage separation. Single liquid fueled engine has shut down and dropped away at an altitude of 126 statute miles. David is an astronaut now. He is in orbit. Wow. Everything's still looking good. Third stage performing in one of the users and open the valve in its liquid oxygen tank. And we have confirmation of the uh, spacecraft separation, so we use capsule and crew safely in orbit. The spacecraft is automatically executing its pre-programmed commands to deploy the antennas and solar arrays. Wow. So docking is uh, likely to occur in, um, in six hours. I'm looking at uh, Julie, if we've gotten confirmation yet. Will it be a, a six hour docking? Okay, I, I'm pretty confident we're gonna have a, a six hour docking from now, which means that about 12.30 uh, local time, we um, should see the, the vehicle docked to the, um, to the station. The crew will not immediately open up the hatch and enter the station. Uh, there has to be some leak checks that are done. It all takes about two hours or so to do the leak checks. They'll get out of their Sokol suit, put on something a little bit more comfortable, and then float in to the space station to greet the three crew members who are already there mm -hmm. with big, goofy grins on their faces. Definitely. Who are, the, I think you know the three people that are already on board the uh, station. I do know them, yeah. They're all pretty wonderful people. So David will be a lucky guy once he gets there. Um, the commander of the space station right now is German and European Space Agency astronaut Alexander Gerst. Uh, he's joined by uh, NASA astronaut Serena Anon Chancellor, and there's also a Russian cosmonaut, I believe that, Ale that is Alexei Prokopiev. So he's in good company once he makes it there, and it's just a wonderful thing to see. I mean, we all know David quite well in this room here at the Canadian Space Agency, but for anyone who's following his journey, this is something that he has worked towards for years, and to see him finally reach that dream is it's wonderful. Oh. David is a very well-trained astronaut, uh, but nevertheless, he's going to depend upon those three crewmates who are already aboard uh, the station. When he floats into the station, if his experience was like mine, he's going to look around and say, this looks pretty surreal. It doesn't look exactly what uh, the simulator showed it to be because there's storage all over the place. There's hoses and there's yeah. cables crisscrossing the, um, the modules that uh, he hasn't seen before. And it'll take a couple days to learn how to fly around most efficiently, Superman style, and uh, organize his, his day of, of work. Wow, he's got a lot ahead of him. So before we say goodbye, I wanna thank Minister Baines for being here this morning. It's lovely to see you again, so thank you. Uh, for people who joined online at science centers around the country or anyone who just had their own launch party, thank you for believing in space exploration and for sharing this with us. It was very special. We'd like to invite you to follow us online or on social media to get updates of David's mission as they happen. For employees of the Canadian Space Agency, we have lots planned for you, both in the hallway and in the cafeteria. And finally, I'd like to ask Minister Baines and Luke on stage for a photo with us, please. Oh yeah, of course, we had a video planned for you, but we got a little rushed. Um, we didn't quite have time for it, and as I said, we were pretty, pretty unable to change David's launch time to suit our <laughs> schedule. So we have a wonderful message um, from David for all of you before that. Bonjour tout le monde à l'Agence spatiale canadienne. C'est un jour très spécial. Quand vous regarderez cette vidéo, je serai à bord de la fusée Soyuz, prêt à décoller vers la Station spatiale internationale. Vous m'avez porté jusqu'ici. Et maintenant, je vous porte avec moi. L'exploration spatiale, c'est un gigantesque travail d'équipe. Quitter la Terre est peut-être la chose la plus ambitieuse que l'humanité sache faire. Le succès requiert toute notre attention. Je suis reconnaissant aux milliers de femmes et d'hommes qui travaillent en coulisses, au Canada et dans le monde entier, à assurer la préparation et le succès des missions. Ce sont leurs talents et leurs efforts, vos talents et vos efforts, 
qui rendent les missions spatiales possibles. Je tiens à remercier tout particulièrement l'équipe canadienne derrière cette mission. Merci à tous ceux qui s'occupent des expériences scientifiques que je vais mener à bord de la station. Merci aux collègues qui commandent nos robots spatiaux à partir du sol. Merci aux gens qui ont veillé à ma formation, à ma santé, à mon alimentation et à toute la logistique de mes déplacements. Merci à ceux qui s'affairent à communiquer et partager cette aventure avec nos concitoyens. Vous avez donné le meilleur de vous-même pour que cette grande aventure soit possible. Je suis très reconnaissant et je suis fier d'être votre représentant. Aujourd'hui, je vais réaliser un vieux rêve et je vais aussi porter vos rêves avec moi. Enfin, j'ai été inspiré par les missions lunaires Apollo et les images d'une splendide planète flottant sur le velours noir de l'espace. Elles ont éveillé en moi un désir d'explorer et de comprendre le plus possible le monde qui nous entoure. Avec cette mission, j'espère que nous stimulerons le même émerveillement, la même curiosité chez les jeunes Canadiens. Nous inspirerons la prochaine génération d'explorateurs. Merci encore. Je vous donne des nouvelles bientôt de l'espace. Thank you. That was nice to hear. Um, all right, we're ready for our photo now. Correct. Yes. <laughs> we have David here as well. Welcome <laughs> to the International Space Station on October 11th. Uh, there's been some um, an investigations and collaboration between Roscosmos and NASA to shift the schedule just a little bit. Um, if you take a look at the International Space Station right now, there's actually four visiting vehicles uh, currently attached to the International Space Station. Two of them are the Russian Progress vehicle that carry uh, crew supplies, as well as the uh, Northrop Grumman Cygnus 10 that's currently attached to the Nader port or the Earth-facing side of the Unity module. Also, you can see there the uh, Soyuz MS-09 that carried the crew, the current crew aboard of uh, Serena Anand Chancellor, Alexander Gerst, and Sergei Prokopiev. A lot of these launches uh, were shifted around to ensure uh, the safe uh, delivery and continuation of continuous habitation of the International Space Station. The crew that just launched today is set to also dock today, uh, December 3rd. Uh, there will be six crew members on board the International Space Station until the crew of the MS-09 that you just saw there. Again, Anand Chancellor Gerst and Prokopiev are set to depart uh, December 19th U.S. time, December 20th uh, over in Kazakhstan. We have another question from Edion, who's asking why is NASA always using the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan for the launch to the International Space Station. The Soyuz vehicle that we just saw launch today is currently the only human-rated vehicle uh, that can provide transportation from Earth to the International Space Station. That is uh, true now, but come 2019, uh, we'll start looking at... Some